Okay. you soon to be Dr. Joe Briggs. He's going to go to uh, Israel for his postdoc. So let's congratulate him first. Um, okay, so today um, Joe is going to talk about some company tricks. Um, <laughs> and, uh, enjoy. I, 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 li I like how this sort of passes as something something combinatoric, something something. Uh, so yeah, I'm, go I'm going to start with a definition that's uh, not really relevant to the rest of the talk, um, but it was kind of the motivation for us doing a bunch of things. So a representable, representable matrix is a Actual chore collection of um, vectors is, is, is a collection of vectors of the same length. Um, yeah, this this seems like something you're very very familiar with. Um, this usually has another name. What yeah. does what is length here? Like dimension or like actual magnitude or? A, 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 a dimension. Dimension. So they're, okay. they're, they're all. Um, so it's just a list of vectors in R. So it's it's a list of. Um, For CN. So okay, my my, my field, I'm I'm, I'm going to let my field be varying um, a little bit over the course of this talk. Um, let me choose. Um, but the point is that we usually see these things uh, called something else. Uh, they're usually called a matrix. So why do I want to, tr even though I can't be bothered to write all of this crap, uh, and we'll always write down the word matrix, um, there's sort of a philosophical difference between how we think about these things and how we think about these things. Um, a matrix isn't just some computer science-y list of numbers arranged in a nice tab. They're really a map between two vector spaces. And I'm not so interested in thinking of these as maps between two things. I'm actually wanting to think set theoretically about the collection of vectors that this matrix represents. Um, sort of more like a computer scientist, I'm sorry. Mathematician. Um, but I realize that when I'm presenting talks, um, I'm not very good at proving things, so there will probably not actually be many proofs of any kind. Um, it's probably not very good, I'm a mathematician, he's not very good at proving things, but that's, that's sort of just how this is going to go. So, um, what am I going to do with a matrix? Oh, um, yeah, so, 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 so a perfect example of a matrix. Uh, uh, you can encode a graph. A graph is a matroid over F2, a representative matroid, in which every vector has exactly two ones. Okay, so. Here's a graph. Uh, no, let's, let's do something like that. Okay, um, it's a it's a matrix. Every column has exactly two ones. Uh, why is this the same thing as what we would normally talk about in a graph? Well, I'm really saying that on this axis I have the vertices, and on this axis. Wait, no, it's the other way around. Damn it, why did I do 4 by 4 That was really stupid. Edges and vertices 
And having a 1 in the ijth entry really means that vertex i is part of edge j. So I have four vertices. One, two, three, four. And the first edge connects one to two. The second edge connects two to three. The third edge connects one to four. And the fourth edge connects three to four. Oh, that's a nice cycle. How very pretty. Yeah. You, sorry, do you need to say anything about policy graph? Ah, or I just don't take them as a set. So that, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know why I picked the long word to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, like this is a kind of stupid example if you've seen it, um, possibly illustrating if you haven't. Um, but this sort of motivates quite a lot of what we will be doing because in general computer scientists and occasionally mathematicians when they want to pretend they can be computer scientists like to be able to sample from a bunch of things randomly and to sample from a bunch of things randomly we need to kind of have some distribution that will allow us to do this random generation and most of the time, people who care about matroids aren't mathematicians, they're computer scientists, um, operations researchers. So they don't really know how to do this in an abstract sense. Um, by the way, I should say, since I've written the word matroid on the board, there's a kind of non-representable matroid where you just abstract away the notion of independence, the things that aren't, necess aren't necessarily being written in a matrix. And there is a way to randomly generate um, non-representable matroids. There's a really, really cool Markov chains algorithm that Alan showed in his class last semester. But these are much easier to draw. I draw the matrix, and that describes my set structure. So um, I'm only going to write down these two. And in particular, there are sort of two ways of generating random representable matroids um, that people have cared about so far. Um, the first one is done by Kelly Oxley in sometime in the 80s, where they just sort of like randomize Every entry. And okay, there are some problems about how you would pick a random entry in um, in this field, a random choice of FQ for all of these entries, if you couldn't ascribe a measure to this field, so it doesn't work so well for things like the reals. Um, if, well, okay, you can do whatever distribution, but for nice uniform <coughs> distributions, this really has to be finite. Um, you get some awkward things kicking around, though, because if you want to do this completely randomly, you will occasionally get same columns appearing twice, and we don't like that very much, because it's like saying that you don't necessarily know how many edges you're going to get in the random graph here. So, um, it's, 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 it's still a fun thing to do, and people have played with this and asked lots of questions about this, and it's quite fun. But more recently, um, from our department, well, some guy who's been visiting Alan uh, for the last, what seems like, a month, and Alan himself, and my advisor, Wes Pecton, they decided that they care about random graphs more. So they want a way for generating random matroids that encapsulates the structure of a random graph. How are they going to do it? Fix a small k, a large m, and pick m column vectors 
randomly, comma, all of which I showed before, and when k is equal to 2, this is precisely the random graph g n f, where n is the number of vertices. Did I fix n at some point? I think this is the first time I've written n on the board. Yes. Okay, fix a small k, a large m, a number of rows, n, and p column vectors of height, and randomly, all of which have exactly k ones. So I'm saying I'm picking a graph uniformly at random among all the ones that have precisely four edges. So, you know, there's a bunch of different ones. Any one of them is going to appear with equal probability. Um, it's going to be something like n choose to choose m, different possible things that could appear. Um, I'm just going to uniformly do this at random. This is not so important because I don't, well, I can't say I don't like random graphs that much. Um, but random graphs are difficult. They're, they're, they're mostly involved doing lots and lots of computations. Um, and in general, it's a train of thought which is what happens in the typical example. Um, if you want to generate a random matroid of this kind, um, what happens to the typical um, matroid 90% of the time? Um, I prefer extreme examples <laughs> because in extreme examples, you can get a little bit more algebraic structure. Question. What is the matroid that optimizes this particular parameter out of all possible things available? Yeah. Sometimes you can get answers more easily this way, sometimes you can't. It's a different trail of thinking when it comes to combinatorics. So, um, when Wes was fiddling around with all of this stuff, proving, um, proving lots of nice results, um, he sort of Piled up, you know. These these two spent all, all, all their lives in random graphs. Um, Wes hasn't. Wes sort of dabbles in pretty much anything he fancies, and so he thought, well, have there been any extreme questions asked in this kind of thing? And he did a quick Google search, and he didn't find anything. Um, so he turned to Boris, our sort of resident extreme combinatorics guy, and asked, hey Boris, have you come across any stuff like this before? And he said, no, I, 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 I don't know anything. So I was like, oh cool, fantastic, that means I can generate an, um, a new set of questions all by myself. Um, what sort of question might you ask? Well, extremal combinatorics is I fix something and I optimize something else. What can I fix? <clears throat> I'm going to fix, let me see, make sure that I don't go off yeah, yeah. So what? Okay. What can I fix? Uh, I, I, I definitely want to fix this k because the k in the random graph setting was really important. The k being two was just the arity of the graph. The larger it would give you hypergraphs of certain kinds. Um. So I want to fix this k. If I fix the number of rows n, I probably won't get anything interesting because that's that's going to restrict my space of possible matroids too much. So the most natural thing to, the, the most natural parameter to, to consider for a matrix is its rank. Linear algebra is all about rank arguments. We want to know what the dimension of stuff is. So this is a really roundabout way that Wes came to asking the following question.
with exactly k once and rank r. Sounds um, sounds innocuous enough. Let's uh, let's have a think. So, <clears throat> what happens when k is zero? Many columns if, 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 if they're not allowed to have any, have, have any ones in them at all. Um, well, if R is zero, then. Ah! Have as many columns. Okay, so um, good, good point. Um, I still want uh, the matrix to be a set. So <clears throat> the columns are going to be distinct. Otherwise, I could just pick one column that, that would be good in any of these scenarios. Duplicate it infinitely often! Um, so, okay, equals zero. I can, I can, I can, I can get the, 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 the column, which is all zeros. Um, equals one. Uh, R, yeah, I do one. I do E1, E2, to E, R. Yeah. 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 Rocket science. Um, yeah, the matrix is only like one, zero, one. This looks remarkably like the identity matrix. <coughs> so, um, if I wanted K to be something reasonably large, perhaps one might conjecture. We can get. I'll choose K by just only hoping to have R rows in the first place, and then just having all the possible vectors with K ones inside them. If I promise you in advance that I'm only going to have R rows in the first place, then obviously the resulting thing is going to have rank in it. Rank at most R. Um, so this is quite a lot. Taking R rows and all possible columns. <coughs> okay, example. Um, so it should only have six columns. I hopefully won't mess this up too much. Zero, one, one, zero. What am I missing? <coughs> zero, one, one. Bless you. Thank you. And R is four, and K is two. What well, is this? This is a matrix where every column has two ones, and I've just got all the possible columns that have two ones. Um, Four choose two is six. Six columns. Boom. Okay. Um, slight hitch of this. Uh, what's the rank of this guy? Three. It's not rank four. I have this really, really awkward thing going on where even though I have like four rows and all of the, oh, well, lots and lots of different columns, uh, I accidentally made it rank one smaller than it should have been. Make it one bigger, then we shouldn't have any problems. So, in fact, when what am I looking at? When k is even, we could just add another row. Okay, so. Let's start to give some stuff some names. So, 
that's um what, what about pleading even mix that? Like, so why does this thing only have rank three? Jiggle it around, subtract things off. Jiggle it around, subtract things off. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to be more stupid than that. Okay. Uh, let's let's look at the columns. They all satisfy this relation. Why do they all satisfy this relation? Because exactly <laughs> two of these are equal to one. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's this sort of really awkward hack. Like, um, somehow, if we could possibly hope to do something with this, we actually need to take into account whether our smaller parameter is, is, is going to be odd or even. Um, maybe this is, I mean, perhaps the problem, this is always something that happens over finite fields. I'm not so sure. So, um, okay, well, here's, here's, here's the starting point. So, when, so, okay, so, 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 spoiler alert, these, these are, well, we can at least show that these are best some of the time. Um, but the starting point was when Wes, so, so, so I, I think of mathematicians doing maths as kind of, um, you know, a bunch of toddlers sat in a sand pit, and they're just sort of given random toys to play with, and, you know, at some point you press the button on the toy in the right way and it does something, but to be honest, it's mostly just sort of picking it up and banging it against the surface and hoping that it does something. Um, and, so, and sometimes that, that, that does do something. But this is an example of us just banging fire truck against the floor. Um, Wes gave this as a question to um, Chris and I, my office mate, who's not here for some reason. Maybe he couldn't stand the thought of listening to my voice for, uh, for an hour or so. Um, but this is something I did uh, together with him. I really shouldn't do this. This is really <laughs> Uh, form. So, in the case k equals 2, we are back to <coughs> graph world. When k equals 2, we actually get that, or in this case, this is the correct answer. The max possible number is choose. Um, and in the graph setting, this corresponds to just having a clique. We have a collection of R vertices uh, and we, uh, we have R plus one vertices. And in this instance, Whenever you take some collection of r plus 1 of the edges, so in this case, some 5 of the edges, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you're going to get a cycle appearing somewhere inside the graph. In this instance, I think it's this triangle. What does a cycle correspond to in the matrix? Well, it's going to be something like a 1 and a 1, a 1 and a 1, and then a 1 back to a 1. So over F2, I add this to this to this, and 1 plus 1 is naught because we're in F2. Being in F2 is very, very important. Um, that's kind of the general setup of the graphic matroid, which is why they like to do things um, over F2 most of the time. But Doing this was pretty straightforward. Um, this was purely graph theory, um, and we then did a whole bunch of other stuff that was all very graph theoretic, um, asking similar questions. It was very, very fun, um, but like I said, all toys and sandboxy. So, what about higher things? Um, 
Well, let's start getting names to all of these parameters. So I'm going to call this ex of rk, the maximum possible number of columns that we can get in a matrix whose rank is r, and all of the columns have k1s. So in this instance, xr2 <coughs> is r plus 1 choose 2. Now, as soon as you define a parameter, you say, well, are there any instances where this is really, really stupid? Um, how big could this thing possibly get? I'm looking at some potentially really, really huge space, possibly. Well, no, because the vectors are only spanning some space of dimension R in total. So even if I could do something really, really, really clever, there is no way that we could possibly get more than all of the vectors in that R-dimensional space in the first place. So, note, x, r, k is going to be at most 2 to the r, no matter what kind of crazy stuff is going on. Um, can I prove this at all? I've left a little bit of a gap here. Yeah! Because the zero vector doesn't count! The zero vector doesn't have any ones, and the zero vector is guaranteed to be in my vector space! Um, that's not gonna... Uh, that one's not gonna count. Um, but, um... Yeah, it's, it, it's possible to actually get that. So... Somehow, there's not a universal bound that's any better than the trivial thing for this. And the construction for this is really nice if you haven't seen it before. You may well have seen this before, but just not in this setting. Um, how do I get this? Well, this is by something called the dual hand. So, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a bunch of vectors that make up the entirety of a vector space, but somehow magically all have the same weight, apart from the, zero, apart from the zero guy. Well, that's basically just trying to make these different possible entries as evenly distributed as possible. And there's a ready-made way. The algebraists already know how to do this. I'll illustrate with an example. What time? Do, how big am I going to make the example? Did I find it in advance? Yeah, okay. So, first of all, I'm going, to do, I'm going to list as a row all of the possible vectors of length 3. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, that bit is easy. Um, this has rank 3. Good start. Um, now I'm going to look at the vector space spanned by these as column vectors. Well, these already have rank 3, so the resulting thing is going to have rank 3. You know, it's, it's going to be very pretty. Well, it's, you can imagine how the rest of this will work. If I have the first two together, I'm going to get 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, that's it. Uh, if I have the second together, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. All of these different combinations are going to give me precisely four ones and precisely four zeros. And this just amounts to the fact that any hyperplane that you can think of in these is going to cover exactly half of the possible vectors in their span. It's literally the same fact. So, yeah, I'm going to get a vector space which, apart from your zero vector, every guy is going to have exactly four ones. And this works for any R. It's a very well-studied thing, and 
kind of, I drew this for small examples and then went, huh, this has appeared somewhere before. So Googled and yeah, this is the, this is the thing. So, um, but this, this had sort of been noticed before. Uh, a couple of people who were interested in questions of this kind, but who weren't thinking about matroids, they were just thinking about coding theory. Um, they were called something like Al Shreda Idinian Chatrian. Um, they pointed out this thing, but they were much more interested in the realm where K was big, and for some reason didn't spend that much time looking at the region where K was small. So we think about that. Actually, it's not really fair to say so. Um, we uploaded all of this work onto the archive, and then someone pointed out to me that these people had written on paper on something very similar. And in particular, they conjectured a bunch of stuff that we sort of managed to prove. So that's the best kind of reference to find after you've submitted a paper. <laughs> the worst kind of reference after you've submitted a paper is, hey, we proved your result already. Um, that was what I was very, very scared of um, when I was told in the paper, hey, you might want to look at this thing that was relevant. So, okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at this thing for <coughs> okay. Yeah, so, okay, what, what exactly did they conjecture? They conjectured that these two paradigms for odd and even k were the correct ones. Um, R plus 1 choose K if K is even, and R choose K if K is odd. Uh, but only in the realm once R is at least 2K. So, in this realm where k is small and r, um, we should hope to get these things what we expect. They could construct actually something that genuinely does better than these, and the paradigm breaks down once k is smaller than uh, once k is smaller than bigger than half r. Somehow, once more than half of your entries are going to be a one, you should just put a bunch of those ones to one side and make it so that the remaining zeros and ones are roughly in half-half distribution. So this is certainly the interesting ring. Um, so we can do this. Uh, the conjecture is true once R is at least, I guess the order of magnitude? Four towers. Four towers. <laughs> Thankfully we invested with that. <laughs> <laughs> Though it's, 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 it's not um, too rare that that's the sort of thing that happens in the uh, economatorics. Um, yeah, so we only have two to be bigger of these left. Um, this is something. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very strange. What we can do is establish some kind of uh, an induction. In fact, the induction is very, very easy. Uh, maybe I'll get on to it. No, I'm not too short of time. Somehow, the main, the main ingredient in all of this is that Somehow the rank is not the right thing to think about. So here's, here's a definition that might be familiar, and if not, um, you should see it at least once in your life. Um, vectors uh, v1 through vk are affinely dependent on the line. some lambda 1, lambda k, 
true sum is zero. Giving us what we would otherwise expect for a linear dependence. This is the only extra condition. Um, but it's a cute little extra condition because it means that the dimension or the rank actually does what you expect for a collection of points in space. So in particular, here's two dimensions. Um, here... You do want those guys to be not zero. Uh, not all zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've, I've, I've forgotten my basic linear algebra. Not all zero. I'm going to write it really small. Okay. So, the point is that somehow if I put these two vectors down in the plane, I'm not entirely sure when I say that their span should be the entire plane. I want to say that their span is just this line. That's basically the corresponding definition of ind affinely independent that comes with this notion of affine dependence. So in this instance, one, two, three, they're all on the same line. Um, these guys are affinely dependent, whereas in this instance, they're affinely independent. <clears throat> like, I mean, I guess I'm used to linear dependence. I mean, played with it for so, so, so many years, but pictorially affine dependence um, is, 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 is actually very, very natural. Um, unfortunately, if we define then affine rank to be the same thing it would be for linear things, uh, max size of an affinely independent set I, there exists no affine dependence, then um, we sort of get dimensions off by one, what we might hope to expect. Um, here the affine rank is two, because these two points are affinely independent. Here the affine rank is three. It's sort of always one more than the polytope dimension. Okay, so... The point is that instead of proving this theorem with the normal rank, if I ask exactly the same question but about affine rank, it simplifies ever so slightly. <coughs> this automatically deals with somehow the difference in parity that we obtain. Because if I have, here's another way to think about um, affine rank in terms of rank. <coughs> the A rank of a matrix is the same as the rank of the same matrix, but with a bunch of ones added underneath. Why is that? Well, having a bunch of ones underneath is adding a single constraint that looks precisely like the sum of the lambda i's is equal to zero. So all of the properties that you would want to have in affine dependence theory um, are exactly the same. It's just that uh, the result is now translation invariant. I can add ones to every single element of the matrix and the affine rank is going to stay the same. This is not true in the rank case. J doesn't have, like the all ones matrix does not have rank one, uh, rank zero, it has rank one. This is very frustrating. I want things to be translation invariant. Um, this sorts out everything. It's so, so, so much nice. Um, how much do I want to say about this? Shut up. <laughs> no, you shut up. <laughs> I'd be really, really put off if that was exactly what the. Um, laptop responded to me. <laughs> uh. 
Ah, okay. I'm going to bother with these lemons. Now, okay, let's see. Uh, I would probably not approve anything. That would probably be best. Okay. So, one thing that's curious when you do this is that, you, you know, so you, you picked up your fire truck, it, it, it does exactly what you want in, in, in the sandbox, box, and um, you then sort of look underneath, and the reason that it does exactly what you want is because it has these wheels. The affineness is the wheels here. You go, wow, this is the wheels. Um, what do you do when you're a toddler and you're holding something that's got wheels? Well, you spin. And every time that you see affine ranks and independence appearing, you see what happens when you translate stuff around and see if you can get anything else for free out of this scenario. And it turns out that you can. Because if you translate your entire matrix by adding one to every element, then you can answer a similar version of the original question, but with k1s replaced by k0s, for obvious reasons. So corollary, the most vectors with a zeros you can have in a matrix of rank at most R um, is again you get the weird dependence but now it's R plus one choose K if R minus K is even and R choose K, if R minus K is odd. Somehow, you got this for free just by spinning the wheels of the fire truck as soon as you realized it had wheels. Um, but this is sort of cheeky. This is very, very cheeky because you realize that actually, whereas a lot of the stuff that we've talked about so far is <clears throat> about F2, admittedly, but could kind of work in the setting of more general fields. Um, being able to say stuff like this is really, really specific to the fact that F2 has zeros and ones and literally nothing else. So, um, question, what happens with other fields? Vroom! Number of possible questions suddenly explodes. And um, we can do some of the things, not all of the things. Okay, so. Let's write this instead as x bar of rk. So I call this co weight. I don't think co weight is really a word so far. But since we're now going to talk about different fields, we need to sort of generalize our notation a little bit. I'm going to stick a 2 here and a 2 here to say that these are over f2. I generalize this for other fields. So, what we can do is that for an arbitrary finite field, Fq, we can get the exact generalization that one can hope for. If I only have k zeros and the rest are allowed to be arbitrary elements that are non-zero in FQ, then a rank R matrix of such vectors can only have this many vectors, provided R is at least 
two to the oh. two to the little o q to the k. Two to the little o q to the k. So this is really surprising. Um, you can. Uh, K to the three halves. It was really, really strange to be able to obtain a bound that was much, much smaller for this problem than for the original problem. Wait, but so what Q's? Is this for all odd Q's? So, okay, very good question. Um, yeah, there's a Q here. It's a little bit of a nuisance. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll be more honest. The honest yeah. truth is a little bit sadder. So it's something like maximum of 3q squared k and uh, q to the half. And, and this is for any q greater than 2. For any q. Yes. But for q equals 2, the q equals larger two. bound. Well, that's yeah. Really good. So, this is one thing that's strange. Yes. Wait, sorry, to clarify. Is this Q that. Are we going to find Q to be prime? No. Or just any finite field? Any finite field. Oh, okay. Any P to the. What's the initial exponent here? Oh, I'm not sure. So, um. This we could get at by. Very, very, very different methods. Um, but it has a dependence on Q, and I don't think you can really make the dependence on Q go away just because you've got Q minus one different entries floating around. Um, in fact, I, I think we can even, even get some explicit thing appearing. Uh, but, okay. I've sort of hidden the fact that there are still other questions floating around here. You know, beyond the fact of pushing this down, pushing the 2 to the big O of k squared um, down, which, of course, I'm very interested in. Um, there's more than just x and x bar. Uh, question. How many vectors can you have over f4 with Exactly k zeros and ones such that <coughs> their span, oh, their rank is r. Somehow, in this instance, I fix the number of zeros as something small, and I can have a whole string of ones and twos. In this instance, the number of zeros I can have is huge, and <coughs> everything else is fixed and small. The affineness means that the particular choice of which letters in the field I want to restrict, and which ones are free to go and do whatever they like, doesn't actually make a great deal of difference. But again, we only managed to really answer all of the questions over F3 because F3 only consisted of 0, 1, and 3 minus 1. Um, F4 doesn't have this property. In fact, any field with <laughs> at least four elements does not have this property. So we're in the weird scenario where we basically know the behavior for F2 and F3, and not F4. Um, anyone has any ideas? I, I would be most interested. I should mention, um, this setup of, of, of our original argument generalizes massively. So, not only can I talk about fixing the number of zeros. I guess I never wrote this down explicitly, but x cube of rk, oops, 
getting the answer that we want um, is true for r is to the omega k squared. Um, in this instance, m most of the entries are zero, and we're only allowed k of them to be something non-zero. So I pick my k entries out of the r columns, and each of them is allowed to be something that's not a zero element of fq. Um, <clears throat> might have a similar question to what Andy asked earlier. Oh, yeah, we sort of have these cues um, floating around here. So if I was being completely honest, but, but wanting to hide the actual detail, I would write the b of omega of q sub q of k to the three halves, because I think the k is the important thing. Um, here this is independent of q. And that's really strange. The proof works regardless of the size of the field. So, in particular, if I fix a list of permissible non-zero entries L and allow some K entries to be in L then even if L is not all of the non-zero things in this in this field. I'm going to have to get... I kept finding this. Everything seems to keep working. So now I generalize the notation even further to tell me about which lists I'm allowed to have. I get exactly the same thing. But with size of L to the K instead of Q minus 1 to the K. What's really funky about this? The field can be infinite. confused about what L is enumerating. Like, are these the um, the rows or the list of vectors? L is the list of entries I'm allowed. So let me do an example. Here's a list of two things in the reals. Um, then oh, my matrix okay. when k is equal to two and r is equal to three. No, that's a that's a bad example. K is equal to one and r equals three is going to something like one zero zero root two zero 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 one zero zero root two zero 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 one zero zero root two. This generalizes like crazy. Um, and you can even do more funky shit like I can have k1 things from this list, k2 things from that list, or k3 things from this list, and k4 things from that list. Any conjunctions of ands or ors that you could think of in this setting, um, it all works. And totally independently of, of the field in which um, you're wanting to do things. So when a a k, um, Edinian and um, Kachatri did this stuff originally. They looked only at the reals and the list consisting of the number one. Um, so they were asking how many, how many points that have k in ones so can you get in a hyperplane. Um, but they did it for every R. So technically there is epsilon intersection between what they do and what we do, since we sort of do much more general than this, much more general than this, um, but sort of you know, the R is something, 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 something. But, you know, different push, different direction. So it's very, very nice to, hear, to, to come across them asking questions about this kind of thing. We were certainly very happy. 
Okay. Yeah, I have managed to not prove anything. I feel quite happy about that. Success. Okay, are there any questions? I go to Jake. Okay, can I ask something ambiguous? You can ask something very ambiguous. Okay, so, so uh, can you say something about the difficulty when R is small? Like, why it works only at a tail? Okay, okay. Well, all, all right. I'll, I'll explain roughly where this appeared. So, um, it was an induction. Uh, and in fact, the induction was really, really trivial. Um, you say something like x of r, oops, x of r k is at most x of r minus 1 k plus x of r minus 1 k minus 1. Does this look familiar? <laughs> There we go. Um, so, like, I, I mean, this is this is literally just using basic stuff about um, affine dependence. You you have this nice little lemma that allows you to expand <coughs> along different rows. You partition um, a matrix into two parts where the entries are zero and the entries are one. Um, this is really easy. So you go, hey, I've got the elective relation. I'm done. Where would we drop the kids in our concepts classes if they wrote that down. Well, they didn't do a base case. Um, we can't find a good base case for this induction. Uh, it's really, really sad. If you could tell me why x of 2k k is equal to um, I choose k, okay, let's do the affine version so I don't have to write two cases. If you could prove this particular case to me, then boom, we actually have the result for all the things at the same time. And we've actually proved the AAK conjecture. Like straight away. But we can't do it. We can only say, hey, this is true for some ridiculously large instance. And in fact, it's not even an explicit thing. We go about it by saying, well, this thing might not be exactly this thing, so <coughs> let's keep track of how much bigger this thing is than this thing. Apply induction. That means that the differences are some decreasing sequence in the naturals. At some point, this decreasing sequence in the naturals terminates. At that point, we know that we get what we want. So it's this sort of awkward situation where you actually have to use a weaker bound on this to prove a stronger bound on this, um, which is always concerning. Um, but it's, it's, it's all we can do. Yeah, give me an example to prove this, and I'll be really happy. Really, really happy. OK. Um, what? Uh, so just overall, um, for the for these for the um, for the Q bounds, uh, I guess for the Q, for the Q but uh, in general fields, is the f proof like have a linear algebra flavor, or can it be translated into a linear algebra proof, or is it like very combinatoric in it, and you're just using um, and like affine in her is like the only uh, in uh, things similar to linear algebra. Um, for this one or this one? Um, let's say the other, let's say the other, I think the, uh, the other one has the, this one. Uh, sorry, um, X bar. X bar. Um, uh, that, that one has the light, has the nicer zone, is that? So, um, this, the, the, this one we can generalize much further. Um, I mean, like, you have this, I would say linear algebraic lemma, which is this thing about affine independence. Something like if I have a matrix, uh, bunch of, well, okay, any anything here, and x is not equal to y, then the affine rank of this thing is at least more, more than just the affine rank of this submatrix. That's 
um, two lines of undergraduate linear algebra. Um, I think that is the full extent of linear algebra that we need for, um, for this one. This, I think we go so far as using the row rank equals column rank. Um, Quite, quite funny, actually. I think at some point um, I needed a, uh, a lemma and I showed it to Boris. I was like, have you seen something like this before? And he's like, yeah, you just managed to transcribe the words row rank equals column rank. So that saved a, about half a page or something. Um, yeah, no, it, I mean, I can't really claim it's either linear algebra or combinatorial because there's so little full stop that goes in. Really, so that yeah. Wait, so just back to um, this uh, base case, we know for free that it is greater than or equal to two to the k two to k by the same example, just the clique. Yes. Uh, so we need the we need that for any n um, any two um, k two to k plus one distinct vectors. Uh, then you get um, high rank. Yeah. 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 If, if, if I mean, this, the, the, this conjecture has been floating around for like 30 odd years. Uh, if, you could, if, if you could show me something like this, I'd be very, very happy. And I don't think it's hard. I really don't think it is hard. Um, someone. Someone wrote uh, for half of his PhD thesis, I think, the particular instance of the original conjecture where the number of rows was r plus 1. Um, but everyone at the time was talking about the number of rows of the matrix. And the whole point of this is, apart from the very start where I talked about n being the number of vertices, I never once mentioned the number of rows. Um, I think that's a difference in thinking that's powered all of this. So I don't, I think people haven't thought about this problem before. So I think it should be. Other questions? Yeah. Um,